So welcome to this webinar on patenting of medical and biotech inventions. Uh, my name is Philip Weber. I'm one of the partners at Dane's Life Sciences Group. So this webinar builds on my early webinars, sort of an introduction to intellectual property and getting patents filed around the world, where I cover the basics of what is a patent application, the criteria for patentability, that is novelty and inventive step, what are search and examination reports, and the various systems for filing patent applications around the world. If you haven't seen those seminars, I'd urge you to have a look at them also. And there are links in the Danes website. If you go to the information tab under webinars, and then you can scroll down to the bottom of the page there, you'll find all of our previous webinars, not only the ones that I've given. So in this webinar, I want to talk about my favorite subject, which is the patenting of medical and biotech inventions. Now I've given a number of similar talks before, particularly to students and academics uh, in the Oxford area on this subject. And I'm always interested to see their reaction as to whether you can patent a, a plant that I found in the Brazilian rainforest or cows with human genes in them. And so I hope you'll find this presentation interesting also. If you've got any questions during my presentation, then you can send them to me during the Q&A button and I'll try to deal with them as many as I can at the end of my presentation. So this slide just shows a summary of what I want to talk about. I'll just remind you briefly at the start about the importance of the patent claims and your definition of the invention and the basic criteria for patentability, just for those who aren't familiar with those. Then I'll go on to talk about patenting medicines, the general pharmaceutical patent strategy of getting patents granted on first inventions and then sort of secondary patents. I'll then go on to talk about patenting DNA, proteins, antibodies, plants and animals, and then finish off with some general comments on patenting of methods, processes, diagnostics and imaging as well. But I must stress right at the start that the, the patent system is very complex and for the purposes of this presentation I've only covered the very basic details. There are however exceptions to a lot of the features that I talk about in particularly sort of different countries and things like that and there are exceptions to those exceptions particularly in the United States at the moment some of which I'll mention. If I were, if I were to include all of those exceptions then we'd be here till, till next week as well. So I've tried to cut through the general maze and give you a simplified version here but it is important, so you know, whilst it's important for you to have an overview of what you can generally pa be patented in this area, it is important to, to seek advice if you've got any specific questions. So this is one of my favorite slides that I look, like to put up right at the beginning and say, right, hands up, which of these can you patent? So medicines, well, of course you can patent medicines. The pharmaceutical industry is vitally dependent on patents. It can take up to a billion dollars these days to get a, a medicine from the bench through clinical trials, getting marketing authorization and then putting it onto the market. And who would spend those vast amounts of money in the knowledge that a competitor could just come along the next day after you put your product on the market and say, right, we can get a sample of this, we can work out what's in it. Uh, we can put it on the market for, for a fraction of a cost that the original inventor has done that. What's stopping them doing that? It's the patent system. If you didn't have patents for medicines, then nobody would make these sort of vast investments in these sort of products in the knowledge that somebody would just come and copy it the next day. So a patent gives you a right to stop your competitors copying your invention for up to 20 years. And so uh, and say it's vitally important for the pharmaceutical industry um, particularly uh, because of the large amounts of money you put into it, but also for other invest investments as well. If you're a small biotech company, one of the first things, one of the first assets that your company is likely to have, uh, and one of the few assets that your company is likely to have is your patent portfolio. You can take those patents to investors and say, look, we've got, we've got patent applications filed to these. We're hoping they're getting uh, patents for these inventions. So give us lots of money to invest in our company and we can make lots of money for you. So, what about these other ones? DNA, if I isolate a piece of DNA from my cat or a protein from the cat um, and I show that this protein is very good for treating cancer, can I get a patent on that? What about a bacteria? If I go down the bottom of my garden and there's a pile of earth next to my shed and I find a bacteria in there that's very good for converting chemical A into chemical B and the pharmaceutical industry has been trying for years to convert A to B and can only do it in a 10 step synthetic process. Can I get a patent on that bacteria as, as the bacteria itself? Or can I only get a patent on the actual process for converting A to B? What about a transgenic plant? If I take a, a fish gene, say one of these fish genes that encodes for these lovely omega oils that are so good for us, and I insert that fish gene into the plant in such a way 
that the plant makes huge amounts of fish oils in the plant leaves. Can I get a patent on the plant or just a process of making it? What about animals? If I take a, a human gene, for example, that encodes insulin and I insert it in the cow in such a way that, it, uh, that the cow secretes insulin into its milk, so I produced a, an insulin producing factory, can I get a patent on the cow or just a process for producing it or, or the insulin? And yeah, some of you might accept you can get patents on animals. So what about human beings? We have the possibility these days of curing single gene defects like cystic fibrosis. I could produce a whole new race of human beings that are not susceptible to cystic fibrosis. Can I get patents on those human beings? Well, if you stay listening, I'll give you the answers in the next sort of short while. So in a landmark decision in 1980, the US Supreme Court had to give a decision on the, on the, on the patenting of a transgenic organism. It was a, a genetically modified bacteria that was modified uh, to, so that it could eat up oil. So for example, oil that had been spilt on beaches. And so the, the US court had to decide whether this was patentable, whether it was as a life form, it was patentable. Uh, and in a famous decision, they gave this quote, everything under the sun that is made by man, presumably by woman as well, um, is potentially patentable. And so the point that they were raising here is that if there has been some human intervention in taking something that was known, modifying it in some way, and producing something new that was, that was, was a potential value, then technically that was patentable. Um, so in this yeah, big decision in 19, 1980, the US, US court said, yeah, we're patenting uh, life forms for the first time in the United States. Uh, whereas back in Europe, we'd have patents on life forms since the 17th or 18th centuries. Uh, we'd have patents on um, some of the yeast that you make for, for brewing, for Carlsberg yeasts and things like that. And so the Americans weren't necessarily very much ahead of the game here, actually quite behind the game. Unfortunately, since that time, the US Supreme Court's been going backwards a little bit, and there's been a, a couple of decisions more recently where they've, they've said basically products of nature are now no longer patentable. Uh, and they've also made some very um, rather poor decisions in my, in my opinion uh, on the patenting of diagnostic methods as well. And we'll talk a bit about those um, during the course of the presentation. So just to remind you before we start talking about patenting of particular things, you know, what is a patent application and particularly the importance of the patent claims. So a patent application, yeah, I've said before, it's a yeah, 50 page book of your invention that talks about uh, the background to your invention um, and specific examples of your invention, some figures to show to put it into practice. But the most important part are the claims. The claims are the short sentences, short paragraphs that define explicitly in words, not in pictures or diagrams, or something like that, but in words, what your invention is. And so when you take your invention to your patent attorney and you go to him and say, right, put this down on the desk in front of him, be it a test tube or a, um, a, a new mouse trap or something like that, the patent attorney's job is to convert that in words into a definition of your invention in the patent application. And so, for example, if you've been listening to my talks a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was talking about one of my inventions here, this beer umbrella. So we, we've got a simple example of fermentation technology here. So we've got a simple mechanical invention, and it's basically got three essential bits. It's got the, as you can see here, it's a, an umbrella that attaches to a beer bottle. And so if it's raining, like it is outside at the moment, it stops your beer getting diluted. If the sunshine is out there, then it stops your beer getting warm, which so it has, has a dual purpose. But as a simple invention, it's got three essential bits. It's got something that attaches to the beer bottle, it's got a vertical shaft or rod, and it's got something that shades at the top of it. And so the claim here, which is a, is a granted claim in a granted US patent application, um, relates to those three essential things. We've called it an apparatus for use with a beverage container, so it can be attached to a beer bottle or a wine bottle. We've, we, the claim relates to something that attaches it, a vertical shaft, and then an umbrella at the top. So those are the three essential things that must be in the claim. We haven't said that the shaft must be a, an aluminium shaft, because what happens if somebody makes a, uses a plastic shaft? Then they, if, we, if we limited it to an aluminium shaft, then we're, we might not cover competitors who make obvious modifications of it. So the important point that I want to raise here is that the patent claim must refer to the essential features, but not the non-essential features of the claim. 
um, and if there's any relationship between those in features, um, it needs to describe those as well. Just to remind you, so that's your definition of the invention. What are the basic criteria for patentability? First of all, your invention must not already be in the public domain. So that is particularly important for, for academic inventors, um, or actually for all inventors. Um, I think a lot of you think that putting invention into the public domain, that's just your nature articles, your cell articles and things like that, your cell papers. That's not true. If you go, if you give a poster demonstration, if you, if, sorry, if you exhibit your poster at a, a poster presentation, that is putting your invention into the public domain. If you go to a nice conference in Hawaii and tell everybody about your invention and give a PowerPoint presentation, that is putting your invention into the public domain. So it is vitally important that you keep all details of your invention confidential at least until you filed your patent application. So that's the first hurdle you have to overcome. You also have to justify your invention is not obvious. Um, so it has to be some sort of inventive spark there somewhere. The rest of your patent application, yeah, you must have to describe how to put your invention into practice. So if you've got some complex chemical, then you need to describe a way of synthesizing it. And if your invention is in the therapeutic area, for example, you're claiming a method treatment, your patent application must show that the invention is at least plausible. You need to have some, at least some data in there, only a basic level of data, be it in vitro tests or basic animal tests. Patent, patent examiners don't generally look for clinical data, but you need to have at least some data in there to, to show that your invention at least has the possibility of working. So with that brief introduction, let's have a look at, um, let's have a look at the uh, examples of different biotech inventions. So first of all, medicines. How are you going to patent medicines? Well, the easiest way to de define them is by reference to their chemical structure. So here we've got a benzylidine amino guanidine compound and the inventor came to me uh, and the, the, on the phenyl ring, he said it has to have a methyl group at the two position. And so one of the first things I said to him said, well, does it have to have the methyl group at the two position or could it be actually be at any point around the ring there? And the inventor said, well, oh yes, actually it could be yeah, any sort of short chain alkyl or amino and it could be any point around the ring. So the generic structure that we defined in this particular pattern application, yeah, had the ring structure as defined in the slide here, where that R group can be at any point around the ring. And so that illustrates one of the, one of the important points of patent applications. It must not generally not cover just what the inventor has made. You need to think also about what obvious modifications other people might come up with that might still work. But if you don't cover those within the patent application, then, then um, you're basically giving your invention to, to the sort of public and find it, giving them easy ways of getting around it. So one of the first questions that the patent attorney will, will ask you is what obvious modifications could be made to your invention and then the patent attorney will, will try to sort of capture as many of those within the patent application as well in order to make it a lot broader. In this particular case, so we've got a claim to a generic, generic sort of set of compounds um, I put my little flag at the bottom there just to remind me that the United States no longer, no longer allows patents on products of nature. So if your product has been isolated from some Brazilian tree frog, um, then you're not going to get a patent on that particular product. But if you make modifications of it, then you might still be able to get patents on those in the United States. So with that sort of so generally pharmaceutical patents are defined by reference to a particular structure and that certainly applies to yeah, any other sort of proteins and um, antibodies that I'll talk about in a minute. But let's look about the general strategy that pharmaceutical companies look in order to, to cover both their sort of primary inventions, but also to maximize protection around their invention as well. So in this slide here, in the middle section here, I, I, the boxes cover the research that, you will be, that the inventors will be carrying out. So they'll be carrying out initial research to find the compounds, you find your generic comp a set of compounds, you then might have a selection of lead before you go into clinical trials. Um, after clinical trials you might get marketing authorization, I've indicated as MA on the slide here, and then you might think about sort of further indications, yeah, can your compound be used to treat different diseases? Uh, you've done all this work, getting through clinical trials and you show that it's not toxic and things like that, how can you maximize your value for the invention by 
by applying it to sort of different um, diseases as well. You might all find that specific salts, specific doses and formulations work as well. And so the general, I put a sort of a general timeline on there as well. So in terms of the patenting, how does this fit in? So the first patent applications for the generic compounds will be filed at a very early stage because you want to make sure that the patent application is filed before anything gets put in the public domain. So in terms of medicines and, and drugs and things like that, a lot of patent applications will be filed at the very early stage and equally a lot of them will fall and be abandoned during the course of the, um, the, the timeline here because not all of them will, will, will get through clinical trials. But the important point is they need to be filed really early uh, in order to make sure yeah, that they are novel uh, when the patent applications are filed. Patents generally take sort of two, three, four, five years to be granted, but in the pharmaceutical industry that isn't a big problem because if it takes between 10 and 15 years to get marketing authorization and you can't put your drug on the market until that time, the fact that it takes five years to get the patent granted is, is not a particular problem. And in the pharmaceutical area, um, you probably know that most, pat well, all patents, yeah, virtually all patents around the world these days have a, a patent life of 20 years. In the pharmaceutical industry, you might be able to extend that by a maximum of 20, sorry, a maximum of five years if you have taken a lot long time to get marketing authorization. This is basically compensation to pay to the, to the patent applicant because it is because they haven't been able to make any money from the invention for up to yet yeah, between 10 and 15 years uh, because it takes that time to get marketing authorization. In some countries, this, the, 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 this extension covers just specifically the product for which you've got marketing authorization. In other countries, it covers the whole of the patent, but generally it, it, you get a sort of maximum of, of five years on those. And it is specific for, for pharmaceutical patents and some plant protection patents. So in this case, the, the patent applicant would have filed the initial patent applications, the primary patents that cover the generic formula that they know that works. But then during the course of the, the further research, they might select a specific, specific lead compound um, and there might be other things that they will find during the course of the further research. So in this particular case, you'll see the first patent related to the generic compound of, of guanidines, whereas during the further research, they found one specific compound, this is the 2-ethyl compound, um, that they wanted to proceed with. Now, in any of these sort of further secondary patents, they will all have to be novel and inventive over the first primary patents because the first primary patent application would have been published at an early stage. And I, I've given on the slide here, the little asterisk here means that, that, that the first patent application will be published at about the one and a half year, that sort of 18 month stage. So all of these secondary patents will have to be both novel and inventive over the publication of the first patent application that relates to this. But so let's look at, at this novel and inventive step criteria. In this case, this compound that's got a, a two position and it's got the ethyl group, that is novel over this because this does not specifically disclose a two ethyl compound. And so this compound is novel over that generic disclosure. And if you can justify that it was had some surprising properties over this, you can justify that it was inventive, then the chances are you could get a patent on that specific compound. So that might be filed, say, at the sort of a 10 year period. And so that will extend its lifetime, will extend from 10 years, maybe up to 30 years, because that's 20, you know, actually my, my timeline is a bit wrong here. So yeah, so that if you file that at 10 years, that will extend its life unto 30 years. So you've got some sort of patent, extra patent protection on your specific lead compound. Equally during clinical trials, say this first compound here, you found that for the development, for the, for the treatment of cancer. During the clinical trials, you find that, find that people have got diabetes, it cured not only their, di their, their, their cancer, but also diabetes as well. So you might be able to get a patent for the use of this secondary compound for the treatment of diabetes or for the treatment of some other medical indication. So you would file that, uh, and that, again, will have a timeline that might well extend beyond your, your primary patents. Again, during clinical trials, you find that the use of uh, this compound or this one 
is specifically good at a particular dosage. So it works best at sort of five migs per kilogram of patient. Um, if you give it to them on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays in a darkened room or something like that. Okay, we've got a new invention. Let's file a new path application for that. You find that your compounds work well in a particular formulation or combination with other anti-cancer drugs, right? Let's file a patent application for that. And that's going to have a longer timeline as well. So you can see in this way that you can build up your patent portfolio. And I was looking at a couple of years ago at the, the antibody patent Humira that it was used for, or is being used for, for treatment of um, rheumatoid arthritis. The primary patent on, hum on the Humira antibody came, came off patent a couple of years ago, but they've got 76, I think it was 76 or 78 other families of patent applications, these like these sort of things, yeah, combinations, dosages, formulations that are still in patent um, and can help to keep all, their, all of their competitors off the market. And so this is an established strategy for, for pharmaceutical industry to sort of maximize uh, the, the value of their particular inventions. So I talked a minute ago about um, if, if, your, if your drug was already known, for example, the, the guanidines that I was talking about a minute ago, but you find new uses for them, you can claim them in that use sort of format. So say, give another example, if uh, during the development of, of aspirin, aspirin was originally developed for the treatment of headaches, as I'm sure you all know, and then later on it was found it was very good for thinning blood or for stopping blood clotting. So if they found that it was useful for, 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 uh, for, for stopping blood clotting, you can't repatent aspirin, but what you would claim would be a method of treating um, blood clots um, comprising giving um, aspirin to a patient or using the examples that I've got here. Say you found that a, new, a known compound is useful for treating Alzheimer's disease, whereas previously the compound was just known for treating cancer or something like that. But in different countries around the world, you have to claim this in a different format, because in most countries around the world, you are not allowed to patent methods of treatment. Uh, one notable exception is the United States and um, Australia allow these as well. So, in the, in, so in, in the United States, you would claim this invention in the format that we've got here, for example, yeah, method of treating Alzheimer's disease, comprising giving the, the medicament to the patient. Whereas in Europe, um, you're not allowed to patent method of treatment, but they do allow patents of this sort of claim. So yeah, basically compound X for use in treating a particular disease. And there are many other countries around the world um, that allow this, what's called a Swiss type form because it was first allowed by the Swiss patent office. So they have to claim it in the use of a compound in the manufacture of a medicament for the treatment of a particular disease. So all of these claims are essentially relating to the same sort of thing. They all relate to, to, to patenting inventions that are based on using known drugs to treat new uses, and they all refer to a particular drug and the treatment. Um, but as I say, different countries, you, you have to, to claim the inventions in different sort of formats. So that's why you, when you look at patent applications, you will see these, at least these sort of three types of formats, um, which are quite common, but they're essentially relating to the same sort of thing. So excuse me while I just take a drink. So say you found a, a new receptor in the brain and you found that this receptor is associated with 90% um, of headaches. And so you've worked out that if you can block this receptor, then you could cure 90% of headaches. You've got a brilliant invention. You're going to make a Nobel Prize out of it. But in terms of patenting, what are you going to patent? Um, you've identified the receptor. Okay, we can get patent claims to a receptor, but are you going to be selling the receptor? Well, no, you're not. What you really want to be putting on the market are the things that bind to the receptor that, that block it and uh, or sort of knock it out. So you've got a brilliant invention, but you haven't necessarily made something that's patentable yet. Um, you might be able to get claims to methods of screening for things that bind to the receptor. And certainly people do get those sort of claims. Um, but what happens if you, if you get patents of those sort of claims, how are you going to know whether any of your competitors are actually using your invention? Because they might be, might be using your screening method behind closed doors, but what they're actually putting on the market at the end of the day are the other ligands that actually bind to the receptor. So they might be patenting or, or developing the, the ligands, um, but you're not going to know how, well, how are you going to know whether they're actually using your screening process or not? 
Um, so what you really want to get is a claim that to, we claim anything that binds to this particular target, this new target receptor. Um, and people have tried to get those sort of claims, but generally patent offices say, no, we're not gonna allow them because you haven't said what you're trying to patent. You haven't actually defined what your ligands are. So in these sort of circumstances, you've got, you've got two options, depending basically whether you're working industry or whether you're working in academia. Now, if you're an industry, you're gonna to say to your inventors, right, we've got a brilliant invention, don't tell anybody about it. We're gonna keep that secret within the company. We're gonna find lots and lots of ligands that actually bind to the receptor. And then we're gonna patent those ligands. And we don't have to tend to tell anybody what the ligands are binding to in the patent application. So as long as you keep that secret as, as a trade secret within your company, you will have the advantage of, 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 of patenting or, or developing lots and lots of things that actually bind to the receptor that cure the headaches, but nobody knows actually what your target is. So you will have that competitive advantage, that commercial advantage. However, if you are in academia, then you're desperate to tell everybody about your world, you want about your invention because you want your Nobel Prize out of this. So if you're working in academia, then the, the best that you can do is try to find as many, if there are any known ligands that already bind to that uh, particular receptor, particularly for if, if there's sort of different uses and things like that, then you might be able to claim methods of treatment um, of your particular disease using those known ligands, or if, if you, you might have already found a, a couple of new ligands that bind to that receptor, or you might be able to make some, some antibodies or antisense RNA or something like that. Um, so basically in academia, you're gonna have to do, make the best job as you can um, on the basis of the information that you've got, you've known, because you, you, you know you want to get your patent application filed, but then you want the sort of published details of invention and claim your Nobel Prize for it. So there are different strategies depending on whether you are working in industry and you can keep everything quiet or whether you are a, a, an academic and it, it's important for your commercial, for your, for your career that you actually get this information out into the public domain. So biological molecules, DNA, RNA, cDNA and things like that, they're all just chemicals as far as the patent system is concerned. And so the same criteria, novelty, inventive step, um, apply to these as, as if they were any other chemical. So in, in a patent application, we will claim a particular DNA sequence or a protein sequence or something like that. But if you looked, let me just sort of skip ahead a second. Um, these are sort of some basic claims to patents. And you'll see we claim a nucleic acid molecule of sequence ID number one or a purified polypeptide of sequence ID number two. We don't put, we don't, unless they're very short, we generally don't put the DNA or amino acid sequences in the actual claims because they would make the claims very long and, and um, unwieldy. And so any patent applications that relate to uh, DNA sequences that have got more than 10 nucleotides or amino acid sequences that are more than four amino acids, then the sequences have to be put in a separate set of, set, separate section of the patent application called a sequence listing. Uh, and this has to be filed in a particular format uh, and it has to be generally filed in electronic form as well. So the patent offices can then receive all this information and they can then electronically compare the sequences that you're talking about in your patent application, whether they're new ones or, or old ones. Um, and so the patent offices can it helps build up the patent office databases uh, by having these all electronically. So, but the important thing is, yeah, that the sequences are in a separate set of section of the patent application and we don't have to put the actual sequences in the claims. So coming back to the claims that we've got here. So if you've isolated a, a DNA sequence, say, yeah, I talked about earlier, I've isolated a sequence, a gene from my cat. Now, the, the, the cat was always, always there, its chromosomes were always, always there, but a chromosome is a different chemical entity to a specific nucleotide sequence. If I'm claiming a sequence, a gene that's got a thousand nucleotides, that is a different chemical entity if, it's, it's, if it is isolated from that chromosome to the actual chromosome. So I've produced a new chemical entity. Similarly, if I, if I purify a polypeptide from within my, within my cat um, there, and I've taken it out, uh, taken away all the other 
proteins that were present in the cat as well and I claim it in purified form, that is a different chemical entity from what it was present in the cat. And so it is novel. And if I can justify that these genes, these proteins have some uh, advantageous use, then I've satisfied the inventive step hurdle. Equally, if, if I've come up with a totally new gene or I've, I've, I've um, genetically engineered a new protein, those are new chemical entities and I probably wouldn't even have to claim them in isolated or purified form because they are new chemicals. Um, and so I'm entitled to claim them specifically as chemicals. The question then arises to, you'd, ideally you don't want to claim to that specific sequence because what happens if somebody makes a modification of that, a variant of that? If you look in claim three here, the way that those variants are generally claimed with, with, the term, with regard to nucleic acids and proteins as well, is we claim, we claim anything that's got a, a reference sequence or anything that's got 80, 90, 95% sequence identity there too, or, or to those specific sequences. So that would cover people who make sort of simple modifications of the, uh, of the, of the genes or proteins that I'm trying to claim. Another important point to remember with DNA sequences is that um, looking back at novelty and inventive step, if your gene, your new gene or your isolated gene is at least one nucleotide or one amino acid different from what's been previously known in the public domain, then you've satisfied the novelty hurdle. There is no rule that says you have to, you can't claim things unless they're at least sort of five nucleotides or 10 nucleotides different. One nucleotide or one amino acid is enough to give you novelty. Uh, for example, if, you found a, uh, if you've changed one amino acid in the active site of a, of a protein and you've increased the, 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 um, the, the, enzyme, the enzymatic capability of the protein by 50%, then you've got a good invention, even though you've made one amino acid difference. Um, so you don't have to have big differences in order to get a patentable invention. So, in other inventions here, you might think, yeah, a, a gene, uh, sorry, a promoter sequence we've got patents for, or even some things like PCR primers. You've changed one nucleotide in a, in a 20 nucleotide amino acid primer, and yet it increases the half-life of the primer by 20%, 50%, then you've got the basics of a good invention here. Uh, looking at claim four as well is also a sort of broader claim. You're claiming that the, the gene that encodes a specific protein so you, you're, you're covering the redundancy of the genetic code there. Claim five relates to some sort of vector that you're gonna work in your, your DNA, DNA sequence. Um, but remember the exclusions in the United States, genomic DNA is not patentable in the, United, in, in the United States. If your DNA sequence is exactly the same as genomic DNA, then that's not gonna be patentable because it's deemed to be a, a product of nature in the United States. Um, but if you claim it, if you put it in a vector, that's a different different story. Or cDNA, that is an artificial construct. That is not a natural product. And so those sort of things are patentable in the United States. So if you've got a claim that if you've got an invention that's based on a particular gene or a protein, then you will be entitled to claim a sort of related claims in, in the, all in the one patent application. So you will have claims to your vectors, your host cells. If your protein is totally new, you might be able to claim any antibody that binds to it. And then particularly the important things that you're going to be putting on the market, your pharmaceutical composition, possibly a vaccine or something like that, that's got your, your gene or your protein in it. So, and I say, as long as these all relate to the same essential invention, then you should, then you would try to get all of these in the one patent application and also together with a method of treatment claim. So if you've, you've developed your gene, say for the treatment of diabetes, cancer, you would also have a method of treatment claims for the treatment of those particular civic, civic diseases in that one patent application. Because yeah, you wanna to try to get as many different claims in the patent application uh, because the yeah, more patent applications that you file, the more your costs are gonna be. So moving on, antibodies, yeah. Antibodies of course are really important um, commercial aspect of, of biotech inventions. The, the scope of what you claim here is going to be vitally dependent on what is already known. If you have found a totally new protein and you're the first person to, to find that, um, then at least in some countries you might be able to claim basically any antibodies that bind to that particular protein, that, that, that particular target. Um, if your protein is already known um, but you found antibodies to a particular epitope, a particular part of that protein that 
um, nobody's previously made antibodies to it, then you might be able to get a claim to an antibody that binds to that specific epitope. Or if you've made a, a hybridoma that, that secretes your antibody, um, you might be able to get claims to that as a, as a sort of cell line. Uh, a lot of claims these days refer to the specific CDR sequences of your antibody. That's the specific sequences that, that bind to the target. Uh, and generally, most patent offices will require you to, to specify all six of the, the CDRs in the patent claim. Even if the CDR sequences of your antibody are already known and you find that the framework regions between those specific sequences are particularly important, you might be able to get a claim to, yeah, the, the complete heavy or light chain sequences or indeed, or indeed the full heavy and light chain, yeah, the variable sequences or the full sequences themselves. If your antibody is already known out, out there, um, but you're the first person to conjugate it to a specific drugs or toxins and things like that, you might be able to get claims to um, ADCs or combinations of your antibody uh, with, with other sort of anti-cancer drugs or something like that, or specific formulations that make it sort of work a bit better. Or indeed, if, if, if all of those were only known, but for the treatment of one specific disease, um, and you found that it worked, your antibody works particularly well in, in a different therapeutic indication, then you might be able to get method of treatment claims. Yeah, methods of, of treating a different disease comprising using these specific antibodies. So, it, so the scope of antibody claims, yeah, as I said, it really matters on you know, what is the, the scope of what, what is already out there in the public domain. And as I said earlier, the Humeria antibody patents, yeah, they had claims to virtually all of these. Yeah, they had 76 different families. So even though the original pat antibody uh, products are off patent, uh, these other sort of combinations of yeah, dos dosage formulations and things like that are still, uh, still alive. Uh, and so helping to keep people off their particular market. So bacteria and cells, again, they're chemicals as far as the patent system is concerned. If you take a known bacteria, you stick some genes in it, for example, some human genes that encode proteins X and Y capable of producing ethanol, then you produced a new bacteria. Although I don't know, actually, I don't think humans produce ethanol. Um, actually, that's probably a good idea. If you put human, if you had human genes producing ethanol, you could get drunk yourself. No, never mind. Let's not go there. So we've got a, an E. coli mutant, a particular bacteria. We've put some new genes in it. So we've taken something that was known. We've modified it in some way. It produces something new that it didn't produce before. And so we can claim that as a chemical product in, in a patent application. We would also be able to claim the yeah, method of producing ethanol comprising culturing this particular E. coli mutant under appropriate conditions and then harvesting ethanol at the end of the day. So that's yeah, a simple claim to a, a bacteria that's been modified. But what happens if you found a, a new bacteria? Yeah, the bacteria down the bottom of my garden next to my shed. Uh, I've isolated this bacteria. I found that it's very good for converting A into B and the, the pharmaceutical industry has been yeah, trying for years to do that. Can I get a patent on the new bacteria? Well, yes, you can. If I've isolated it, then, and I claim it in that sort of isolated form, that is a different chemical entity from what was present down in the pile of earth at the bottom of my garden. And so the hand of man has been involved. Yeah, I've isolated it and I found a particular use for it. Then I can claim the patent, then I can claim that particular bacteria. And I can also claim sort of processes converting A into B. Uh, in the same patent application because it all relates to the same sort of invention. But the issue here, here is how can I describe the patent, up, how can I describe the new bacteria in my patent application? Because Article 83 of the European Patent Convention, which I've, con which I've quoted here, says you must be able to describe it, your patent, you, you must be able to describe your invention in your patent application in a manner that allows somebody to, to carry it out. So I could say in my patent application, well, I live in Oxford and if you go down the bottom of my garden next to my shed, you can do some digging there and you'll probably find this bacteria. Um, patent examiners generally don't like those sort of descriptions of how to put the invention into practice. So the answer in this particular case is that I would have to deposit a sample of the bacteria at a recognized depository authority. Now there's a, a, a treaty called the Budapest Treaty under which a number of uh, international depositories, including ATCC and places like that, that are recognized that if you deposit your bacteria uh, or other microorganism 
at one of these recognized sites, then that is sufficient to, uh, to satisfy the, the enablement requirement of patent applications. So then when your patent application is published, they, they will make samples available to the public uh, under certain circumstances. So that is the way that if you have a totally new organism, then you might have to do that in order to, uh, to satisfy this particular requirement. Of course, in the United States, it's a product of nature, so you're not going to get a patent on that. Uh, another thing to be aware of that if you're if you're working with new bacteria, new microorganisms, for example, you go and uh, test waste sites to try to find bacteria that uh, eat up toxins, or you go to find thermophilic bacteria at hot springs and things like that. There are a lot of requirements around the world these days to disclose the origin of where you've got these bacteria. Um, because basically the, the, the countries, you know, your Brazils and things like that, if you've made an organism, if you've made an invention based on an organism in their country, they want to make some money out of it as well. So a number of the patent laws around the world from individual countries say that if your invention relates to a, a genetic organism or a, or a biological material, you have to state in your patent application where you got that material and that you, and that you had prior informed consent PIC uh, to get samples of that material from the from the uh, country where you got it from. So when these patent applications are then published, the countries like yeah Brazil can can then can look through them and say ah oh, this person yeah Glaxo have been down to our Brazilian rainforests and they've made they found some of our frogs and they've squashed them up and they've they've extracted anti-cancer drugs and Glaxo is making billions out of these drugs. Yeah, we want some money from you. Thank you very much, Mr. Glaxo. Um, so be aware that if you are using organisms like this, then a number of individual countries have already specified that your patent application has to say where you got them from. And they're trying to bring this in on an international scale, uh, but it hasn't been brought in yet, but it might still, be, might still be done. So do watch out for that. Plants, yeah, same sort of thing. They're chemicals. If you take a, a known plant, you modify it in some way, then you produce a new chemical entity and technically that's patentable. So a lot of people get patents on plants that are resistant to sort of frost or salt or they make biopharmaceuticals in their leaves or even I've seen yeah, inventions based on uh, bioluminescent plants. You plant them down streets instead of street lamps and things like that. Um, again, so if I went to Brazil and I found a totally new plant uh, in the Brazilian rainforest, could I get a patent on that? Here's a question for you again while I take a drink. So the answer is, is no in this particular case because the plant has always been there. We haven't modified it in any way. There's no hand of man. All you've done is taken the plant. You haven't, um, you haven't done anything to it. And so you would not be able to get a patent on the, on the, on the new plant itself. But of course, when, as soon as you start doing it, anything with it, if you, you crush it up, if you make an extract from it or you extract a gene or a protein from it, then you can get patents on those sort of things. But then again, you've also got the same sort of question as, yeah, if you claim an extract from a plant um, that is useful for, for treatment of cancer, how are you going to describe where that plant is? Um, you, again, you can say, well, you fly to Brazil and you go through this down this little path in this little Brazilian rainforest and you'll find it at the bottom of this really big tree. Um, examiners don't like that. So again, the answer here is would be, would be to de deposit a sample of seeds of the plant um, or some other sort of genetic material that would enable somebody to make the plant. Um, and there are in, in a seed bank or something like that. So animals, again, yeah, they're chemicals as far as the patent office is concerned. If you've taken a known animal, you've stuck a, you know, you've take, taken a cow, you've stuck a human gene in it, um, you have produced a new chemical entity, something that is new and potentially patentable. So yes, I will be able to get a patent on the cow um, and I would be getting, able to get a patent in this particular case if I, if I put human uh, insulin into the cow. Um, into the human genes encoding for insulin into the cow, then that would be potentially patentable as well. So animals, mammals, yep, they're technically patentable. So coming back to my example of, of human beings, human beings are animals, mammals, technically I suppose they're patentable. So if I can produce a whole new race of human beings that are not susceptible to being, um, to getting cystic fibrosis or something like that, can I get patents on them? No. 
the important word here is morality. Most countries around the world, notably excluding the United States, have laws against patenting immoral inventions. Um, the trouble is most patent examiners, they're, they're scientists, they're, um, they're, they're patent experts, they have similar qualifications to patent attorneys. Yeah, we all have science backgrounds and we have training in patent law, but we don't have training in sort of morals and ethics. And so it can be very difficult for patent examiners to, to try to judge the morality of the invention. Um, so why are the rules there? Um, the argument I've seen is that because patent offices, their their government departments, they shouldn't be seen to be um, approving inventions that are immoral. Um, but the, but you know, I suppose that's a sort of reasonable justification. Um, but in most cases, the, the the laws just said you're not allowed to patent an immoral invention without giving much guidance as to what it can be. Um, but maybe that has to be done that way because morality changes over time. I mean, think of things like contraception or heart transplants. They were both considered to be immoral in their day, whereas now they're sort of generally accepted. In Europe, we have the, the, what's called the Biotech Directive, which was passed in 1998, and it specifically said you cannot get patents on human beings. Uh, and more recently, it's been used to knock out some patents in Europe that were claiming uh, human embryonic stem cells because those were found to be immoral as well. So, so yeah, so we have to watch out for, for patents on uh, if they cover human beings and things like that. Even in the United States, they're not allowed to, I think the, the US Patent Office is not allowed to spend any money granting patents on um, human beings. And so whilst they haven't got a morality clause, uh, they've brought in sort of a way to stop patents granting on human beings in other ways. So finally, I'll just sort of finish with a few comments on general methods and process claims. So up till now, I've mainly been talking about sort of patenting of products and getting patented products is, is, the, is the best, most um, valuable protection because anybody who sort of makes those products, sells them or uses them will infringe your particular patents. But you can get patents on yeah, sort of processes for producing things. Um, for example, the, the examples that are, I've, I've given here. Looking at some more specific examples, yeah, the, the top claim here, method of reducing the rodent population, comprising, yeah, using a particular rodenticide. So here we just got a, a sort of general method. Um, in the bottom claim, it's basically a, a chemical process patent. Yeah, process for making um, some uh, sort of compound A, B, comprising the step of reacting A with, with B under certain conditions using particular things. And so those sort of claims can be important for, for patent applications as well. Diagnostic imaging methods, sort of magnetic resonance and things like that. Quite often they come across sort of biotech uh, patent attorneys desks as well. Um, you might have heard that you can't get patents on computer programs because these are basically computer programs, aren't they? But that's, whilst that is, is true in, 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 in most countries, that refers specifically to the actual computer program itself. Whereas in terms of the imaging method here, it will be claimed in the format here as, as a method of imaging. Um, and so it's a method of doing something. So this would not fall within the um, exclusion on computer programs and things like this. You might have issues as, as to whether it, it's a diagnostic method. And so, certainly in some countries, you're not allowed to patent by diagnostic methods. But in this case, you see that the, 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 the patent claim is written in terms of a, a method of imaging an artery. So it's not saying a method of diagnosing coronary heart disease or something like that, which might fall within an exclusion on diagnostic methods. But if you're just claiming a method of imaging an artery, that doesn't necessarily directly lead to a diagnosis. And so you, you, you should be allowed claims for these sort of things in a number of countries around the world. And so, so this is basically the, the algorithm that might form the basis of the computer program. And so that's how you'll claim it in the, in the patent for, yeah, not, in the, not, in the, not as a computer program, but as a sort of algorithm that refers to the essential steps that lead to the computer, uh, lead to the sort of diagnosis at the end of the day, but without specifying it. In other cases, yeah, you, you might well want to sort of claim the diagnosis itself. So here we found that a particular protein that is present in blood correlates with the presence of Alzheimer's disease. So here we've got a method, direct method of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease, comprising taking a blood sample, seeing whether the protein is present, and if the protein is present, saying that that is indicative of Alzheimer's disease. So this, again, is unlikely to fall within the general ex dis, um, exclusion and diagnostic assays because it's an, 
an in vitro test. Most of the problems with diagnostic claims are ones where they actually sort of have carried out on the actual patient, whereas here we've got an in vitro claim and so that shouldn't be a problem. However, in the United States, the Supreme Court, one of the recent Supreme Court decisions, has classified diagnostic assays like this as laws of nature. They are saying that you're trying to monopolize a law of nature that says there is a correlation between this particular protein and Alzheimer's disease. And so these sort of claims are currently not being allowed in the United States. Um, but patent attorneys are clever people. They find their way around any of these sort of things. And so these sort of claims, one way to get around them would be to do these steps and then administer a, a particular disease, sorry, <laughs> administer a particular protein, sorry, administer a particular treatment um, to the patient afterwards. And so you would say a method of diagnosing and then treating the patient with a particular um, drug. And so then the overall method isn't just a law of nature, it's a, a diagnosis and a treatment. So that would fall outside the exclusion in the United States. So there are ways around even sort of um, claims like this. So finally, um, I hope you've managed to um, stay right through to the end. It's been a bit longer than I, I thought it. So just to summarize, yes, of course, you can get um, patents on drugs. And the rest of these, they're, they're generally treated, I say, like complex chemicals by the patent office. If you take something that's known um, and you modify it in some way, then you've produced a new chemical entity that is technically patentable. Um, so it's that, and, it's that, and if you can show that it's, you've, you've made some uh, change that's novel and inventive, then all of these are technically patentable, except human beings. And so be very careful if you have any claims that cover transgenic plants or transgenic animals, because they are not allowable. There was a, a case a couple of years ago where I think it was a British examiner at the European Patent Office granted a patent on a transgenic animal. Now, animals in England, I mean, you think of animals as cats and dogs, um, whereas humans aren't animals, but biologically speaking, yeah, humans are animals. And so this poor examiner had in fact granted a claim to transgenic humans in, in the European Patent Office. Well, Greenpeace came along and they bricked up the doors of the European Patent Office and spent the day waving flags outside the Patent Office saying, kind patent auf Leben, no patents on life. And so since that time, the European Patent Office has been very careful about any claims to transgenic, transgenic animals or transgenic mammals, and it changes them to transgenic non-human animals um, if you do get any claims to those sort of things. So, um, but with that exception, yeah, most of these are patentable. Yeah, there are quite a few exceptions that you need to tiptoe around. And so, yeah, do talk to your patent attorney about the best way of doing those sort of things. Finally, um, a lot of what I've been talking about today, um, I've put in, in a booklet that is available on our website. Yeah, a number of people used to ask me, well, is there no sort of general, general guidance on what you can patent in the biotech area? And so a couple of years ago, I sat down and, and wrote it all down. Uh, and this booklet is available on our website. And um, I will ask Michelle, our uh, business development person, to um, send you the link to this um, so you don't have to go sort of hunting for it yourself. Um, so I think that's the end of my presentation. I wonder if we've got any, any questions? Yeah, all right. Um, somebody's got a question here. If you're gonna claim to a specific DNA sequence, does it have any value in just claiming that sequence itself? Yeah, that, that's a very good question that is, is not easy to answer. Um, yes, you, you, you'd be right to saying that if you claim a specific DNA sequence, you yeah, have sort of AGCT and whatever, that will technically only cover that specific sequence. And so if somebody, if your competitor came along and changed one nucleotide within that, then technically that would fall outside the, the scope of your claim. Um, sorry. Um, but there are a number of laws around the world that expand the scope of what you're actually claiming. For example, in the United States, they have what's called this doctrine of equivalence. And this has re recently been brought in. Sorry, my... sorry I'm, I think. Are you still sharing my screen? Um, Michelle, can you, is my, yeah, I'm not sure whether my screen's been paused or it says it's not, but you don't need to see that for the moment. So I was talking about, yeah, whether you can 
whether the scope of a, a DNA sequence is is uh, oh, sorry, someone's all of us right. Um, let me just put that aside. Then I'm getting distracted by this question. So I was talking about um, the scope of DNA claims. So yeah, there are. In, in some circumstances, the courts will expand the scope of a, of a DNA claim or a protein claim that refers to a specific sequence to cover variants of it as well. Um, I say this law has very recently been brought into UK, UK law, and so we still don't know how, how broad this is going to be. And so basically, if, if somebody says to you um, that we've got a claim to a specific sequence, um, a competitor's made a sort of minor variant of that, um, are they allowed to do that or does that fall within the scope of my claim? It's a very difficult question to, to advise upon um, because yeah, we don't know whether the courts would, would expand the scope of that claim to cover those particular variants or not. And as far as I know, there haven't been any court decisions anywhere around the world, uh, as far as I'm aware, that address this specific point. So I hope that gives you the answer to that one. Another question, what are the prospects of being granted claims to an antibody that binds to a specific epitope and that epitope has not been described previously? Um, so antibodies bind to a specific epitope. Well, yes, you can, if you can, you can define that epitope uh, in a number of different ways. You can define that epitope by, if you know exactly what the amino acid sequence of your target is, whether you've either got a, a continuous sort of stream of amino acids or a, or a discontinuous sort of epitope made up of a number of different peptides. You can define that epitope either by reference to the target, or you can try to claim any antibody that binds to the same epitope as my antibody, or that competes with it, or, or something like that. And so there are a number of different ways that you could you define that epitope. Um, the issue in those sort of those sort of cases is generally whether the, the patent office examiners might force you just to, to down to the scope of your epitope that you sorry just to the to the antibody that you've made because that's ch the chances are that's the only one you've made and therefore is it appropriate that you get claims to any antibody particularly in the United States they will give you a lot of hassle on that sort of question. Um, but you might be able to get those sort of claims through in other countries as well. Um, another question we've got here is how much data do you need in your patent application for support therapeutic diseases? Yeah, that, that again is a, is, a, is a very good question um, and is, isn't always difficult to answer. Um, as I said at the beginning, you, you need some, if, if you're claiming a therapeutic method in your patent application, for example, a method, a new method of treating cancer, you cannot just say, right, we claim cancer by treating this particular drug. You need to give some, at least some basic level of data in the patent application to support your particular claims to, to that particular therapeutic treatment. So, but it can be quite, quite basic level. Some in vitro assays to show that if you've got an assay that's representative of Alzheimer's disease, be it an in vitro assay or an animal assay, when you apply that drug to that assay, does it give you some indication of some positive result? So, and you need to have, the, the, the courts certainly in Europe these days are saying that you have to, the information that you give in your patent application must make it at least plausible, at least credible that your invention will work on the basis of everything that's in your patent application, taking common general knowledge into account as well. Um, once you've overcome that hurdle by having that level of data in your patent application, then if it's challenged later, then you'll be able to then you'll be allowed to file further data to, to justify the conclusions that you made. But if you haven't got that basic level of data already in your patent application and ideally in your priority application, um, then you won't be allowed to submit that further data later. Uh, and so you might well be in trouble at that point in time. So the answer is you need at least some data, but it does, it, you don't need clinical data from humans and things like that, but, but you need to have at least some data in your patent application. Um, question, another question, how does the level of protection differ from supplementary protection certificates compared to the claimed invention of a patent? Yeah, as I said earlier in one of my earlier slides about pharmaceutical inventions uh, and the pharma strategy, in a lot of countries around the world, you can extend the life of your patent beyond 20 years. Now, in some cases, you can only extend the protection that uh, applies to the specific 
drug that you've got marketing authorization for. That might, yeah, that might be a very sort of narrow protection, but, but that is a drug that you put on the market. And other countries, you can extend the whole of the patent as well. So it depends on country to country uh, and the different and the length beyond 20 years um, varies from country to country as well. But as far as I I'm aware, the five years is the, is the maximum amount of time on it. So, um, uh, can I, uh, and that looks like quite a long, long question. Maybe I'll answer that one afterwards from, from Emma. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, I'll get back to you on that one, Emma. Right, I think I'll call it a day there. And so, yeah, thank you everyone for listening. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Michelle, who's just going to give you a brief information about uh, the, the other, invent, other, other webinars we've got coming up. And I said, Michelle will send you details of how to access that booklet that I wrote as well. So from now, I'll say thank, thank you and goodbye, and I'll hand back to Michelle. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. Um, I hope you found the content helpful, and thanks, Phil, for presenting. It's definitely a very interesting Good topic. Afternoon. We'll send everyone who logged on today supporting documents and information sheets on the subject and also answer some of the questions we didn't manage to get to today. We do have a number of webinars lined up for the summer months, and I hope you'll join us if any of the upcoming topics are of interest to you. Next week's webinar is part of our Introduction to IP series, and we'll be looking at design protection. And then the week after, we'll be covering the, patent, the patentability of diagnostic inventions in the US, Canada, and Europe, which may be of interest to our audience today. You can register for all our webinars on our website or by using the links in the follow-up email to this webinar. And also, just a reminder too, that we've also launched the IP podcast, which you can find on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Just search for Danes. These are 15-minute jargon-free episodes that take a look at all aspects of IP, and we generally release an ep uh, episode every Friday. That's it from us today. So thank you for your time, and take care, everyone. And We'll see you again soon.